Uh, it's 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Uh, 45. 15. Yeah. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, so first, I would like to thank the organizers, and uh, for the very kind invitation. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, the first time to be in Korea, and uh, to be here. So. <coughs> So, I will so I will start uh, with the equation, which is quite familiar to many of you. So the title is about some uh, singular solutions. So I want to uh, discuss some. Uh, background, uh, at least for me, uh, why uh, I'm interested in uh, such results for similar solutions. So, so we know that if we have a solution of this, then, well, uh, well, you, you may want to put a constant here, so that so n greater than three. So then, all solutions are classified. So u of x will be equal to a 1 plus a squared so all these are solutions and uh, all solutions have to be one of those so uh, and this result <coughs> Uh, so the have a number. So, uh, so these two assume. Uh, some hypothesis at infinity and uh, low nitro hypothesis and this one will uh, prove the result without any hypothesis. <coughs> so usually these things are useful in uh, studying uh, uh, equations which after blow up uh, you end up with this entire solution. <coughs> So, uh, this equation has some conforming variance. So, so uh, if we take phi to be Mobius transformation, So these are generated by translations x to nx a is a positive constant and so these three transformations uh, you use it and it generates a group of transformations so this these transformations you call it phi and it is called Mobius transformation. So in dimension and so this transformation has the property that it preserves angle. So if you have an angle like this, after mag phi, uh, this angle uh, will be preserved. So and in dimension three and up, so all local play angle preserving map uh, is actually a restriction of such a global one. So it's a theorem of the order. Does it mention the rotations as well? Pardon? Mention the rotations as well? Uh, it includes rotation. But it includes rotation? Yeah, yeah. It, it covers. Asymmetrics. Pardon? Asymmetrics. 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 
It's a constant. <coughs> a is a constant. Yeah, the rotation can be picked up by oh, those. I see, I see, yes, I you see, can I see, I see, yeah. take a couple, make yeah. a composition, you get the yeah. I see, I see. rotation. Yeah. It's included. Yeah. And these are generators. So, uh, so if you have a phi, so usually, uh, and if you have a function, so take a function and take a phi like this, you define another function. So this is the Jacobi. And this is a composition. Yeah. So you define like this. So then, uh, this Laplacian operator has this property. So, so this is an identity. Compose this feed. So, so what is this U feed? So this looks uh, a little bit abstract if we don't uh, uh, use it every day. So, so, uh, so if phi, so for this phi, so I will write for these three phi, what u phi is. They look uh, very familiar. So, so this one, if you take this, first one, u phi of x will be simply u x plus x bar. And if you take the second, it's going to be a n minus 2 over 2 u of a x. If you take the third, it's going to be 1 over x n plus 2 u x over x squared. This is a count, uh, uh, except this is a minus 2. So, so therefore, you see, if you have one solution to this equation, which means the ratio is equal to a cup 1, say, so then all the u phi will be solutions. Yeah. So this conformal transformation generates a family of solutions, and these, actual, these solutions are actually obtained that way. You actually have a unique unique solution and then generate it by the conformal group. <coughs> so uh, <coughs> well one can one can look at this, uh, one can look at a type of operators uh, if you call it conformally in this maybe in kilometer, no? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, conformally invariant ones, so you look, <coughs> so you can look at, say, an operator, uh, it depends on u, it, it depends on gradient u, and it depends on the hashing. So if an operator has the following property, that if you put gradient u, gradient square u, and uh, compose with phi, then we call such operators conformally invariant ones. So in this case, the h so in this case, the h, u, gradient u, gradient phi, gradient u is equal to minus Laplacian divided by u n plus 2 over n minus 2. So this is an operator. So <coughs> it turns out that, <coughs> so this is, uh, uh, so with, uh, more student. Uh, <coughs> so it turns out all conformally invariant operators must be of the form C 
So they must be of the form a symmetric matrix, symmetric function, and eigenvalues of a matrix. So what 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 does AU look like? So AU is defined by uh, I write it in terms of W. So W is equal to U. So you give me a, a positive function U, I, I can write another positive function W. So, so then I calculate the Hessian of W, I calculate the gradient and square, and I put the identity. So this is an n by n symmetric matrix. So this is n by n symmetric matrix. So the reason I'm writing uh, in terms of W is because the formula would look longer. Yeah. So, so then this means eigenvalues. This means eigenvalues. So F is a symmetric function. So F, symmetric. Symmetric meaning if I take f of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n, and then I make permutations of lambda 1, lambda n, they stay the same. So one fact is, if you take any symmetric function, you take this as an operator. So I give you a u, you calculate the values through this. You first look at the n by n symmetric matrix function, and look, go to the eigenvalues and evaluate it there. So this operator will have this property. And actually, so all conformally invariant operators must be of this form. So this operator uh, is natural. So sometimes in literature, it's called a conformal Hessian. So this is Hessian, but you know, this is conformal Hessian. So I, uh, I will state some results about conformally invariant elliptic operators. So such operators may not be elliptic. So we, we, I will only look at those which are elliptic. So uh, so in R n. I will introduce a cone. So this is a cone. So this part. I call it gamma. So gamma is an open cone, convex cone. Open. Oh, let's make it convex. Open convex cone. And vertex is at the origin like this, and gamma contains the positive cone. So this cone that is the first quadrant. So each coordinate is positive. And it belongs to the summation is positive. So that's a cone which is actually the half plane. So this is the cone. So for some reason, this cone, which I will mention, this will be called gamma n. This will be denoted by gamma 1. So it's on this side. And, uh, and let's take a symmetric function f, <coughs> symmetric. Which, which is positive in gamma and equal to zero on the boundary and you assume df d lambda i is positive in gamma so for each i so this means elliptic so this is the same as saying the equation will be elliptic then the same 
So I, I look at elliptic equation. So then there's the theorem, which uh, this was proved uh, with Albin Lee some years ago. I think it's uh, 2005. Maybe. <coughs> and the theorem says the following. So take those f and gamma. So let's look at the equation f of lambda of au to 1 and lambda of au is in gamma u is positive on Rn so then the conclusion is u will have to be one of those So there will be a B here, B is positive. So there has to be a B there is <coughs> because you multiply this by constant, it's a solution. So F star is an R. So that's a uh, extension of this one. So why it is an extension? So so here we look at those uh, we look at those symmetric functions. So if I take f of lambda to be equal to now some notation called sigma one, so that is the sum of n. Then the equation, then this sigma one lambda of a u, you take that, this is the f will actually be equal to this. So this is what you see. And uh, <coughs> other examples, important examples would be the k elementary symmetric function. So gamma k is equal to those lambda where sigma 1 all the way to sigma k are positive. So this is gamma and this is your f. So these all satisfy those hypotheses. In the, in the second case, what, what would be the Yes, the, in the second case, yeah. So the second case, it is quite difficult to really write them down uh, explicitly. It, it looks a little bit messy, but sigma 2 looks pretty nice. And sigma 2 <coughs> is basically like this. So sigma 2 of lambda of a matrix will be more or less like... Uh, so, so this, um, so I have to, so you see, this is lambda I1, I lambda, so lambda 1, lambda 2, plus lambda 2, lambda 3, something like this. This, you can write it as lambda 1 plus lambda and square minus some multiple of lambda I square. Yeah. And this is the trace of the matrix because sum of the eigenvalues is the trace of this matrix. And this one is the norm square. So at least you can write an expression explicitly in terms of the Hessian and the gradient. Uh, but if you go to sigma 3 and sigma 4, uh, you don't really write it looks quite, you have to go without such an expression. <coughs> Even though the, the operators are different, the solutions 
or the same? Or the same, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite, uh, so this is sort of, these are for conformally invariant solutions. So you can say it's a matter of uniqueness. So this thing has unique solution, modular the conforming invariants, and uh, actually the solution are the same. Yeah. And uh, so for <coughs> so for for elliptic equations like lambda Hessian like this, so on such cone, so such equations were first studied in this generality by Caffrelli, Nuremberg, and Sprague in the 80s, I think. <coughs> and for this theorem, this theorem, so for sigma 1, so this is, we mentioned, so earlier result, so this is the Laplacian one, so Caffrelli get a Sprague and get a Nuremberg and so on, and uh, that's the same linear one, and if you look at sigma 2, and n equal to 4 and 5, and uh, also, for n greater or equal to 6 under the <coughs> integral equation, uh, condition. So this was proved earlier by Alice Chang, Gursky, and Pao Yang. <coughs> so uh, our methods are different from those. Uh, so we move the uh, moving plane method. So in treating such uh, uh, this problem, a crucial <coughs> issue is to analyze some certain <coughs> behavior of solution near an isolated sing singularity, and which I will explain that part. <coughs> so this equation is a. Uh, fully nonlinear elliptic equation. So here there is another solution uh, result which is much more classical. And this one says that in Rn, you have an entire positive solution, then u must be a constant. So that's a classical Liouville theorem. <coughs> So, well, back to this equation. This equation means the eigenvalues of this AU, so something like conformal Hessian, the eigenvalues lies on level set, F equal to 1. So you can draw the level set like this. Right? F is a function, so F equal to 1 is a hypersurface where F is so equal to 1. So, so that says, you know, you have this surface. If you are, the eigenvalues of the conformal Hessian lies on that surface, then you must be of this form. And in fact, it simply says this AU is an identity, actually. This AU turns out to be an identity matrix, and so therefore. Okay. So there's, a, I'm stating another theorem which is an analog of the second one. So, so 
So this result says that if lambda of AU belongs to the boundary of gamma, or equivalently, say f equal to zero, yeah, just, just lying on this boundary. And u is positive and in Rn. So the theorem says in uh, is a C0 one viscosity sense. So we don't have to worry about this. You can think of u as a C11 function and satisfy the equation almost everywhere. Yeah. So the conclusion is u is a constant. So if you take gamma to be equal to, if gamma equal to gamma 1, that result is exactly this statement. So, because that forces Laplacian u to be zero. So, such results uh, are useful in obtaining optimal uh, Harnack inequality for conformally invariant equations. And for that optimal result, one needs C01. But for C11, one can already obtain uh, certain results. So, and this theorem was proved uh, earlier for so Chang Gursky Yang for sigma 2 and n equals 4 and uh, C11 solution and uh, also by Albin Lee for sigma 2 n equals 3 C11 solution So this result follows the method here. Well, uh, that result is by a completely different argument. And I will perhaps try to explain idea of the proof for this. OK. <clears throat> and the proof of this, an important, uh, a crucial point, is to understand certain behavior of solutions to degenerate elliptic equation near an isolated singularity. So now I want to describe some proof. And after describing some proofs, I will uh, mention some results. Oh, perhaps. I should maybe state some results first before entering into proof. So, and then we see the some relevance uh, for that. So, uh, let's look at So, as I said, this results concern uh, behavior of solutions near a singularity. So here is a classical result. <coughs> Let's say, uh, if say we have a Laplace equation equal to zero in a punctured ball, or if you have super solution is fine. So let's say W is positive in a punctured ball. So the conclusion is actually the solution near zero should be positive. So the if the half of the ball or simply lean inf W of X is positive. So it is, so if W is smooth 
And this is like strong maximum principle. Strong maximum principle tells you for a second order elliptic equations, if you have solution positive, uh, now negative solution, if it's zero at some point, then it has to be zero nearby. Well, this is not quite uh, that because you have a singularity. Yeah. So, of course, this result is classical, and if you replace this by a set, where the Newtonian potential, Newtonian capacity is zero, the result is still true. So, so the set is small, and therefore the equation doesn't really fill it. And uh, this condition is necessary as well. If you want something hold for Laplacian, uh, uh, for all harmonic functions, this set has to have capacity zero. So these are very classical results. So, <clears throat> and in our proof, actually in both proofs, some feature of this is rather crucial. You need it. So, well, the natural lay, and for some specific equation, though, yeah. So, and the natural lay, uh, if we look at, we may ask ourselves the following question. If I have a smooth solution in a punctured bore, and I, and I have another function which is a smooth on the whole bore, and I have an elliptic operator, So this operator is elliptic, elliptic. Namely, if I take d f d m i j, so let me. function, and when you differentiate with respect to the matrix, you have positivity. That means elliptic. And I assume u is bigger than v in b1 minus 0. Can you say that in m u minus v, this is positive. <coughs> so that would be an extension of that. Well, uh, if both u and v are smooth, if u is actually smooth, then w equal to u minus v will satisfy the elliptic equation in B1 minus 0, and the conclusion will follow from the strong maximum principle. So you will have this, and you will have that. So W0 has to be positive. This is the strong maximum principle. But here, the situation is we are dealing with singular solutions. So one of them is singular. And the answer to this is, in general, no. You can write for instance, so this is, in general, the answer is no. In general, no. The answer is no. So an example, you can write like this. So let's take n equal to 1, l equal to 2, 3, 4, etc. Alpha. Now, 
this belongs to 0 or 1. And you take 2 of x is equal to a power, and v of x identically equal to 0. Then you look at the operator. This is an operator. It's, it's a very nice operator. C infinity and so on. But f acting on u is 0 and uh, acting on v is 0 and clearly u is bigger than v off away from origin but it, it, they touch. So, you, so this is in general. It's no. So So this is a and uh, so if you assume in addition Then the answer is yes. So if you assume in addition that your solution is superharmonic away from the origin, then the answer to this is yes. And you can also uh, read less than constant, for example, it's fine. So there are other uh, variants of this, yeah, which I want. Uh, not this. So there's a paper on my web page, so details can come. And, and this result for for this conformally in, invariant one. So th this I, I proved uh, like uh, uh, 2006. Yeah. So uh, for this particular operator, I proved this result earlier, but the proof is relying on this particular operator. I made use of some invariance. Essentially, I used one parameter of invariance of the problem. So, <clears throat> and we, we are writing uh, uh, some sequels to this paper where we also have results for degenerate equation and for other extensions, so I will not uh, describe. <coughs> so I think I want to uh, describe, outline the ideas of uh, these proofs. Yeah, without uh, giving <coughs> details, the papers are available on my web page. <coughs> And actually, so the proof of these two theorems uh, are, uh, I can, the idea can be it explained just for semilinear equation. Yeah? Because with the conformal invariance, uh, many things look the same. <coughs> so I will explain the first proof. So this result. <coughs> so <coughs> proof of theorem one. So for this proof, uh, we may very well just think of this equation.
And uh, instead of this more complicated one, <coughs> so, so first, Laplacian u is less or equal than zero, and u is positive in Rn. So that implies the lim inf is positive. So the reason is you have a superharmonic function. You have positivity. You just compare to this function on the set where x bigger than 1. This is maximum principle. You will get this result. So for that equation, this Laplacian u less or equal than 0 is built in, actually. So this means Laplacian u less or implied Laplacian u less or equal. So we are dealing with only superharmonic functions. <coughs> With the above property, with this property, and with the property that u is positive, and u, say, is c1 log c1 rn. <coughs> so this three property allows the following. So this three property implies there exists a number positive for any x in Rn. For, there exists number such that the so I, you give me a x such that for all lambda bigger than zero, less than lambda zero of x. So you give me a point x in the space, I can find a number lambda of zero such that if the radius of the ball is smaller than this number, then u x lambda, I will explain the notation, will be bigger than u of y for any y in the punctured ball. So ux lambda of y is the Kelvin transformation with respect to this ball. So in formula, we just write it as So, uh, so, to pr so that means for small sphere, your function and the Kelvin transformation has an order, has an order inside. Yeah. So to achieve this, you don't really need the equation. So you see, I only need positivity, smoothness plus that. That's it. So the proof will take half page. So I will skip it. So. <coughs> So now, this is like a moving plane, so it's a kind of variant, it's a moving sphere. So I will enlarge this ball until somewhere it stops, the largest radius. So, so we can define this is the largest. Largest meaning there's the largest open interval so that for lambda inside you have this property. So this can be infinity and can be finite. Can be infinity or finite. So then you show that the key point, a key thing is to show if this is infinite, less than infinity, then the Kelvin transformation and u will be the same in the punctured ball and therefore everywhere. Everywhere. 
it's the same. So it's just, if it is here automatically, it will be in Rn. So, <coughs> so this is the key step for this and also for that. So the proof of this is like this. So, so you have a, so I, so let me draw, this is x, this is b, lambda of x. So I have a, uh, yes. Mm. So I have a uh, I have a u which is smooth. This is my u. I somehow have a u x lambda. So which may have a singularity here, huh? The u x lambda. So I I prove this by contradiction. So how do I prove it? If not, this would be bigger. Would be bigger than you in the pump principle. This step I use strong maximum principle because if it's equal somewhere, I look at the difference of the two functions. We are satisfied a linear elliptic equation for this and for the more general one. So you get this, and then you so you will be like this. You, then you want to say that you want to say that the inf they don't touch. You want to say the strong maximum principle holds also for this singular one. This is your, your, what you would like to prove. So you want this property. So once you have this property, it's finished because then the function will look like that. Then you just, by looking at the formula, you will see you can push this sphere beyond this number. There's no, nothing really to prove. Uh, so, well, except, yeah, you, you use some uh, half lemma for the boundary. So, so, so then, that's the key. So, well, now if you look at the semi-linear equation, that follows from the classical result because you see inside, I have two equations. I have minus Laplace u equal to this, but this one is less or equal than ux lambda bar. I already know the order, and this is equal to minus Laplace ux lambda bar of x. And therefore, the difference of two solutions is actually superharmonic. So the, this, this is a superharmonic function, and they don't touch, follows from the result for superharmonic function. So then there's no problem there. But here, for the fully nonlinear one, there one needs to prove that result. So it's not uh, an obvious uh, fact. <coughs> so actually, when we first proved this Liouville theorem, we didn't really prove this local version. We made use of some global information to push through. But the ingredient there allowed me to pr prove the local version later. <coughs> but now, uh, this version is much, much stronger, this theory. So it goes to full generality <coughs> for superharmonic view. Well, yeah, yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. well oh, when you consider the degenerate repetition and the very long difficulty, like it, because the diffusion coefficients are really dependent on the W, and how do you from such a difficulty? Yeah, degeneracy de de is much, much more subtle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So this one, so it is kind of funny that this in the linear, in the gamma one, sigma one case, you are talking about Laplace, and nothing to worry about. This is degenerate. So it's much, much uh, more delicate, I would say, the degenerate one, than the, than the, uh, the elliptic one. Took me much longer to handle that. <coughs> so, uh, 
I'm running out of time, so I will not talk about the, maybe I will not talk about the proof of this. So I would like to show you an idea of proof here. Can I still use four minutes? Three minutes. <laughs> Oh, I accidentally one. Huh? Two, two, two or three minutes. Two or three minutes, yeah. So, <clears throat> I just want to describe this proof, but I want to describe the proof for <coughs> harmonic function. So I want to give a proof for harmonic function. So, so, so to prove this result, one needs a proof of this result, which can work for nonlinear equations. Yeah. So what I will describe is actually a new proof for this classical result. <coughs> so how to prove this? So what I prove is for any ball in Rn, so uh, you draw a ball. So I look at <coughs> u and u hat. This is Kelvin. So conform harmonic function are con have conformal invariance. This is harmonic. That's harmonic. So I'm going to have a center. So <coughs> so I'm going to have. Laplace u hat zero from center, Laplace u equal to zero on the ball, and u hat equal to at, at least greater is actually equal to u on the boundary. Yeah. Let me make it equal. So, so I claim that I have this. Yeah. So this is the classical result I stated. You look at the difference, you have super harmonic function, one is equal to the other, so you have an order. So I use one thing, I used conformal invariance, I used a comparison theorem, I used only two properties. So, so once you tell me you have a continuous function in Rn, which have the property you give me a ball, then the Kelvin transformation and your function have this order, then this property itself tells you u is constant. Yeah. So, so that apparently is a calculus statement. So, so then, so this proof, I believe is new, new at least for me, and uh, uh, for this, can be adapted for that, because this property is conformally invariant by the definition. So you are only look at conformally invariant stuff. So this is okay. We're not doing anything. So then it boils down to prove a comparison principle for, uh, for, for those solutions with singularity. So this is again a singular behavior. So, so this is a, in that case, is a degenerate fully nonlinear second order equation. Apparently, uh, a lot of more lengthy work enters there. Yeah. But it took me quite a while to figure out the method in, of, of approach. So uh, I think I will stop. Yeah.